Hi, I'm Philosophy of Science and uh, this is my channel where I explain scientific method and uh, it seems that also things that are about argumentation theory and fallacies. Fallacies are part of argumentation theory and this is only because I realized that flat earthers seem to be using fallacies pretty fallacious ways, uh, incorrect ways and I would like to give a community uh, some weapons against uh, fallacious use of fallacies actually explain a bit argumentation theory which I'm going to do today and uh, about fallacies so uh, yeah and as you can see there was my new uh, intro sequence that I'm going to uh, actually make better it's not finished but I still put it there because well that is what I was able to last week put together last week and as you can also see I have uh, this cartoon avatar that I also also did last week and well it's a bit janky and looks weird at least when I look to the corners but uh, anyway I'm going to make that uh, better also but this was my first ever live 2d creation so considering that I'm kind of kind of uh, pretty pleased with the result but it's not going to be this chunk I'm going to make it a lot better in the future and maybe I even going to uh, draw a better model for it but at least for now this is going to be model I'm going to be using I think it's fine it's good enough uh, yeah and yeah I did a facelift for my channel generally as you can see I have a banner and a logo as well I, I did last week but yeah and uh, this week's structure video structure is going to be uh, that I'm going to give a small lecture about argumentation theory as the last week then I'm going to explain how you can use the information that I given you and then I'm going to uh, take a look at the fallacy video where quantum razor is is teaching other people about fallacies even though he doesn't understand them himself and and I'm going to comment on what he got wrong the few things where he got something right and yeah I'm going to put on the dis in the description I'm going to put the timestamp when this lecture stops so you can if you're just interested on me picking apart Quantum Razor's video, well, well it was Nathan Oakley's video, but in Nathan Oakley's channel Quantum Razor was giving a lecture, uh, that video, then you can just go in the description and push the button and it should take you to the right moment where this lecture ends, but I would suggest that it would be good for flat earthers and not flat earthers everybody to understand a bit about the argumentation theory and today we are going to uh, well we don't we are going to take a look at the argumentation structure uh, normally uh, when people are thought argumentation theory it, it starts from bit uh, more basic things but it would require actual lecture series to do it so that's why I think the good starting point is argumentation structure okay and now let's start the lecture so in the lecture I named it argumentation basics and here is how to identify an argument so every utterance in a discussion it isn't a, a, a argument so that's why we need to know uh, how we can identify an argument and argument necessarily have two things 
as I did right there at least one premise but there can be multiple premises and very often there are multiple premises it's pretty rare well I know not not rare but but oftentimes arguments have multiple premises and a conclusion premise uh, here is an example two examples where I, I demonstrate what premise is and what conclusion is the part that I have underlined that is the conclusion and the first thing you can notice from these two examples that in the first example the uh, the conclusion is first so conclusion isn't always the last thing that is said it's actually pretty often the first thing when I used to debate uh, the structure that I was thought was that uh, first thing when you sh you should have three points which are basically conclusions so three conclusions and when you start your speech 10 minute speech I, I did British parliamentary debate format so in there it was pretty u usual to have three points so when you start your speech you you tell everyone that I have these th three points so you state your conclusions first then you say that okay now I'm going to start talking about this thing so then you say that you say again your fir first conclusion and then you give the premises why you think that this conclusion is correct so it's pretty usual and useful to start with a conclusion so uh, the listener or reader knows what you're talking about uh, but it's also sometimes the last thing so uh, the first example is that eating fruits and vegetables is beneficial to health because people who consume this food stuff statistically live longer okay and so the premise here is people who consume this food stuff statistically live longer and the conclusion is eating fruits and vegetables is beneficial to health uh, and so the conclusion is basically the thing you like to state uh, as a fact or like uh, 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 well, well as a conclusion it's the thing you're arguing for and the premise would be here people who consume this food stuff statistically live longer it is what you use to argue for something so premise is basically the thing you the reasons you give for believing the thing you are arguing for so here people who consume this food stuff statistically live longer is reason to believe that eating fruits and vegetables is beneficial for health and my other example is I can see too far with my P1000 so earth must be flat S so I put this here because even bad arguments are arguments because argument is something that is trying to establish a claim but this is not good argument for multiple reasons that I'm going to go not go here but here the premise is that I can see too far with my P1000 and it is uh, offered as a reason to believe that earth must be flat so here the premise is first and the conclusion is after but the main thing to notice is just that the premise is something that is used to argue for something and conclusion is the thing you're arguing for and uh, why I have uh, boldened because and so uh, it is because they are uh, argument indicators that I'm going to go in the next slide but just the because tells you that next thing that is being said is offered as a premise and so there it is tells you that the next thing that is said is 
offered as a conclusion. So that's why they are bold. And, and so here, argument indicators. So this list is from the book called Logical Self-Defense by Ralph H. Johnson and J. Anthony Blair. Uh, and I try to remember to put this also in the description as in the last video or every book or article I'm referring to. So, but yeah, this list is from that book. And argument indicators, there are premise indicators, which means they these are where the things that were meant to uh, to be that are offered as a reason for believing something so there this would be because given that since granted that for for the reason that and when you see one of those you know that the next thing is premise and is offered as a reason to believe something but as we saw in my examples here uh, in the in the second example there is no indicator you just you're just expected to understand that the first thing is offered as a premise so this can be helpful to identify premises but they are not always used for example, when the premise is the first thing uh, in the sentence. And here is a co conclusion indicators. This would be therefore, thus, it follows from that. So, accordingly, in con I conclude that, hence, and so, my conclusion is. And these uh, indicate a conclusion so these when one of these is in the sentence you should know that the next thing is a conclusion of some argument or a other other way to put it is the thing that the writer or speaker is arguing for so these can be helpful in that way but as we saw here in the first example there is no conclusion indicator because it's the first thing in the sentence sometimes people put the indicator in the in the beginning of a sentence but not always so these are just helpful these don't tell you in 100 percent of the cases if there is a premise or if there is a conclusion uh, implied in the argument and this is one of the things we are going to run over many run too many times that in argumentation there is no uh, hard, oftentimes there is no like a hundred percent sure way to know anything these are just things that help you to understand things but they are never ever well, never, but most of times there is no 100% sure way to know that there is an argument or there isn't the argument. Okay, and here are different argument structures, and these are basically from Trudy Govier's A Practical Study of Argument book, but I have modified them a bit so they are not uh, exactly like in the book, but this is basically about the same information that in the book so and here the one uh, is where the p1 a p means premise and c means conclusion so you know there you can see there up there up like here there is one two the three and four and this is first structure, second structure, third structure, and fourth structure. And this uh, rectangle here, it just means that uh, these are what I would consider like a 
basic forms and this would be not so basic but this is in Trudy Govier's book so that, that's why I included included it in here but yeah but from here there's just from one premise to one conclusion and these both examples even though they are in different or order both of those are type one there's one premise that leads to one conclusion. So there would be example, they, they would be, these would be example, both one, both of these would be example of the one. Here I have written these, these arguments as a, their formal structure. So here uh, the P1, people who consume this fruit who consume this I should say why it should say people who consume fruits and vegetables live longer therefore eating fruits and vegetables is beneficial to health and here, here so, so uh, here, here the the send uh, the parts of the sentences, sentences are uh, in, in a different, different order because the formal representation is always premise first and conclusion uh, second. So sometimes if the argument is in a different order as in the first example, uh, then you have to switch them to make the actual formal representation of the argument and, and the, the second, second is just, just as it was no, it's just therefore in the between uh, I can see too far with my P1000 therefore earth must be flat so it's basically almost the same as it was here to two this is a different kind of argument I have example of that in the later slides but there there is one premise that is offered uh, to support, su support second premise. So basically uh, P1 and P2 would kind of form their own argument that is as a whole offered as a premise for this conclusion one. But in this structure, uh, this uh, argument isn't uh, its own argument and that's why I, I write it P1 and P2. So P1 is offered as a reason to believe P2 and then P2 is offered as a reason to believe the conclusion. This is also pretty common argumentation structure and there can be like infinite amount of premises that just lead, lead to uh, from one to say second second third third to fourth and so forth but yeah at some point the argument becomes impossible for humans to understand so there is actually a, a real world world uh, stopping point for that but in, in in theory there could be infinite amount of these uh, here this is also pretty common but there would be two premises that independently of one another uh, lead to conclusion uh, so sometimes they are yeah sometimes they're independent so that p1 is independent and it leads to c conclusion one and p while p1 is independent and p2 is independent and they both lead to uh, a c1 but sometimes you need both of them and I have a example of that there as well so that this won't lead to this alone and this won't lead to this conclusion alone you need both of them to be able to may, uh, may make the case that the con conclusion is right I have an example of this and here we have uh, I have an example of this as well uh, and here we have one premise that leads to two different conclusions. 
so yeah and let's this one probably this seems pretty uh, unclear but uh, I think that the examples will help okay, okay. and here, here we, we have a few examples, examples and these examples are taken from truly Govier's a practical study of argument book and the uh, example goes uh, a computer, computer can cheat, cheat in game, game because, because cheating requires deliberately breaking rules in order to win. A computer cannot deliberately break the rules because it has no freedom of action. And here at the right corner you can see the argumentation structure. And this plus means it was the thing that you need both of them to get to the conclusion. So either P as alone or P3 as alone or P2 as alone won't be sufficient to argue for C1. So that's the, this is what this plus here means. And uh, here is a formal structure. I have I have written this argument well copied it from Tree Govier have written this argument this way as its formal structure p1 is so p1 would be here uh, a computer has no freedom of action then there's thus meaning that this is offered as a reason to believe p2 which is here and p2 is a computer can deliberately break the rules uh, and then p3 is here and cheating requires deliberately breaking the rules and therefore C1 a computer cannot cheat. Okay, so you need both of these P2 and P3 to make a conclusion C1 understandable and this is because uh, P3 gives you a definition of cheating so it says cheating requires deliberate breaking the rules but if you just offered p3 uh, as your premise this it wouldn't make any sense because it doesn't talk about computers so so a listener wouldn't understand what you were what you were saying also if you just offered p1 a computer cannot deliberately deliberately break the rules a computer cannot cheat uh, so if you just offered p2 as your premise for the conclusion it wouldn't make sense because it talks about breaking the rules but then it talks here about cheating so you need both p2 and p3 to get to this conclusion neither of them isn't sufficient because it's not uh, the argument wouldn't be understandable without both of these uh, and uh, the P2, a computer can deliberately break the rules. Somebody might not think that this is the case uh, on its own, and that's why you need P1 that tells you that uh, a computer has no freedom of action, so that you can make the case that uh, deliberately breaking the rules requires a freedom of action. So that's why you need P1 to uh, argue for P2 and then you need P2 and P3 together so you can get to the uh, uh, your conclusion which is C1 and here this is also from Trudy Govier's book uh, and this is from John Locke uh, labor is basic basics of all property from this it follows that a man owns what he makes by his own hands and the man who does not labor has no rightful property and here at the right side is the argumentation structure this is totally the same that i mentioned here this is the four and here at the left is the formal structure P1 labor is the basics of all property property therefore a man owns what he makes by his own hand so this is from P1 to 
C1. But, you, but Locke also argues that labor is the basics of all proper property, therefore a man who does not labor has no rightful property. So P1 to C2. So as you can see here there's just one in, in the, uh, the structure there's just one P but when you write it out as a as its formal structure you have to use it two times because uh, it needs to be in both of these uh, arguments as a premise so basically there are two arguments actually but they just come from the same premise okay and that was the lecture I have for you today okay and I am going to talk a little bit about how to use it so uh, how how why was the lecture before important well that is because uh, as we saw in the last video at least one of the fallacies uh, Guantan Razor was claiming was just because he di didn't understand or didn't want to understand the actual argumentation structure that his opponent was uh, claiming so it's important to for you to understand uh, argumentation structure of your opponent so you can uh, make uh, rebuttals or accept his arguments but it's also important uh, to notice some of the fallacies because uh, some of the fallacies actually use techniques to make people think that there is an argument even though there is actually not uh, why, well, one of the, well, the red herring fallacy is one of them because uh, in the red herring fallacy that the quantum radar was talking about the the uh, arguer offers uh, or starts talking about something unrelated to his con his or her conclusion uh, but if you pay attention and you understand argumentation structures well you should realize that okay uh, there is no connection between what the argue is talking now and what his actual claim or conclusion is so that's why it's really important for if you want to argue or debate with people or understand arguments uh, it's very important to understand the argument the structure because first it helps you to actually understand the arguments well it also uh, actually the third thing is it helps you to make arguments and this became very clear to me when I was debating so but uh, the two main reasons is that you can understand arguments and you can spot fallacies the problem with this is that I'm totally sure that this short lecture doesn't give enough uh, understanding for anybody to be able to start spotting these argumentation structures it requires a lot of work uh, I think that when I in the argumentation one course in the university I think we I think we I, I don't know if I'm not sure if it was the whole course if or if was it just half of the course we just used uh, to trying to spot argumentation structures we were given a text and we were supposed to find the first find the arguments and then uh, write the formal uh, formal representation of those arguments and then draw these 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 uh, structural uh, pictures about these arguments and that really helped me to understand uh, argumentation to understand other people's arguments and to make my own arguments and help me in uh, academic debating to make 
uh, better arguments, make more clear uh, speeches and and such, because it. Uh, the third thing is that if you understand these things and you can use them on a fly, uh, your speech is way more uh, easily, it's more, more easily understandable to other people. And I'm very bad at it still, but I'm much better than I used to be. So that's why I think this is very important, but this requires a lot of work. But uh, you can what you can do you can read something like a, I don't know a newspaper or whatever or uh, scientific literature or anything where people make arguments and try to spot first spot arguments and then try to uh, think what is the structure or just keep these things in your mind when you listen to YouTube videos or other people talking uh, and try to think what the structure the other people is telling you uh, is and that's that's how you get better at it the best thing would be to actually read a some book like the Trudy Govier's book or some other textbook and do the actual exercises in these books but I understand that most people are not going to do it I think the second best thing is just to keep these things in mind and, and try to uh, try to picture the arguments that other people are making that you're listening or reading uh, and then try to think the what the structure is and little by little you get better at it and some and and uh, and I think this is actually what I'm pretty good at because uh, when I'm debating or arguing with someone uh, I'm always thinking of the structure of my argument and other people's arguments and that's why it's pretty hard to get me sidetracked because I'm always thinking of these things but yeah so, but that was the lecture, and next I'm going to go to the video and analyze analyze the rest of the fallacies, or at least most of the fallacies. There are so many, I'm not sure if I'm going to do all of them. And I'm going to use a bit of this that I this the knowledge in this lecture to do it. Okay, and now we are going to start looking at these fallacies, and here is the first one, it's the equi equi equivocation fallacy. The equivocation fallacy. Now, a lot of people confuse this one too, but an equivocation fallacy is the illegitimate switching of the meaning of a term that occurs twice during the reasoning. It is the use of one word taken in two different ways. What is the prime word that you can equivocate till the cows come home with? Theory. You got it. Go ahead. Theory. Theory or one other one? Gravity. Why? Because they're two different versions. So... The statement leading out, scientific theories are the result of validated scientific hypotheses. However, in colloquial terms, theories are just abject speculations. Like, my theory is that white dwarfs are caused by luminescent gerbils. Well, that's not a scientific theory. Now, if you're not in a scientific discussion, then this isn't a fallacy. I mean, everyone says this. They use theory like it's, you know going out of style but remember it's in the context it's got to be in context if we're in a scientific discussion and you say the i'm going to stop you every single time i hear theory and you know this yeah okay so what quantum razor is saying here it's basically true and okay but yeah people i make this mistake all the time also that i for uh, by mistake use that it's my theory when I use should have said my hypothesis but yeah it's true but it's like it 
doesn't matter because most of the time it's pretty clear if people are meaning hypothesis or theory so yeah it's true but it's not important in my opinion because it's happened about 10,000 times in the past four and a half years the other example like i said the rumpus does this all the time with gravity the force of gravity bends space-time do you see the equivocation here force appealing to essentially the universal law of gravitation which has been debunked and space-time bending the universal law of gravitation has nothing to do with space-time bending this is an equivocation fallacy it's 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 hidden but it's hidden in plain sight you got to be ready for it yeah okay this is uh in a sense right what quantum reason is saying here that that uh, in, in einsteinian physics uh gravity is not a force but it's extremely clear in this context that uh, rumpus isn't using uh, newtonian uh, interpre interpretation of uh, gravity he's just using it colloquially meaning that the thing we can cal calculate as being gravity bends time so if 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 you take everything absolutely literally then this could be said to be a equi equivocation fallacy uh, but yeah you shouldn't but flat earthers do this because it they think it makes them sound smart when they're actually not this is just like playing dumb when you absolutely know what the other other person is actually saying so this is not a good example of equi equi equivocation fallacy it's a hard thing to say but there would be uh yeah, I don't know what would, would be a good example. So, okay, here is an actual example. I think the second one, this is from the website uh, www.txstate.edu uh, slash philosophy slash resources plus policy definitions slash equivocation so yeah and it says that the law implies lawgiver there are laws in nature therefore there must be a cosmic lawgiver and this is like in a uh, uh, the discussion about uh, god this is very often used version of equivocation fallacy where in the first sense the law means something like uh, the laws of nation some written rules how you should act and in second sentence the law means like a natural law which is like which means like a principles of our physical world works so therefore you can't this therefore doesn't follow because the law in first sense and law in second sense isn't the same thing even though it sounds like to be the same uh, so the because the term actually refers to two total different things this argument uh, this uh, conclusion does not follow so this is real example of equivocation fallacy and all all of these others are probably as well but i just picked this one because it's pretty common in another discussion let's continue okay and here is the next one this is ad hominem fallacy we all good 
Yeah, sure. Ad hominem fallacy. Now, this seems benign. I'm going to do it out of principle because we busted a lot of people with this one. Because they just, they just, at home, at home. No, 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 no. So let's discuss what this thing is first. Ad hominem fallacy, also known as personal abuse, personal tax, abusive fallacy, damning the source, name calling, needling, refutation by character. Listen closely to the description, however. It's attacking the person making the argument rather than the argument itself when the attack on the person is completely irrelevant to the argument the person is making. So it's in lieu of an actual argument, an insult in lieu of. Follow? So claim scientific theories are the result of validated scientific hypotheses. The fallacy? Come back. You're a moron. See, he didn't deal, the person didn't deal with the actual tenets of the argument. He just floated uh, an insult. That Okay, and now this is actually, uh, this is uh, totally relevant to the lecture I had in the beginning of this video because the problem here, if what Quantum Razor is uh, showing us here, if this would be argument, then it would actually be ad hominem fallacy. But uh, most of the time when flat earthers claim that someone is making an ad hominem fallacy, it's just they haven't understood something or refu refuse to understand something and then the other person calls them a moron or something like that. It's not supposed to be an argument. Uh, it's just an insult. And this is important. That's why we need to, un we need to be able to know what is an argument argument and what is not an argument because then we won't go around throwing fallacies at everybody when they are uh, saying something that isn't actually an argument and we think that it's an argument and then we say that it's a, it, it is a fallacy so uh, most of the time when I've seen that flat earthers claim that somebody is using ad hominem fallacy against them the question isn't the the other person isn't trying to discredit what they are their argument by saying that they are moron they are just insulting them because they are so uh, fed up with uh, the flat earth there's not understanding or refusing to understand the argument they have been explaining to them multiple times, the flat earthers multiple times. So that's why uh, this is true, that if that would be an argument, it would be an ad hominem, but I haven't never seen it actually being used as an argument against uh, flat earthers. But as I said last time, most if not well, not, not all, but most of the fallacies, there is actually a totally fine way of using the argument seem from the last video. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go and watch the lecture I had in my previous video about fallacies. Uh, so, these argumentation seems can be used totally legitimately. And at hominem the same kind of argument for example if we uh, I've, I've heard I, I have ne never seen this video myself and haven't uh, listened to this uh, recording but there should be I'm not sure if this is true but I've been told that it is that there is uh, a video where one of who was it? It was some of the Natans, Flat Earth Nathan. I don't think it was Oakley, it was somebody else. It was Nathan Thompson. There may be a video, I'm not sure who, you have to uh, look it up yourself. But let's say it was Nathan Thompson, I'm not sure if it actually was. And there's a recording where he says that he doesn't actually believe in Flat Earth. 
uh, but he's still presenting himself as a flat earther. So now if you, you know this and he is making flat earth arguments and we tell him that there is actually this video of you saying that you are not a flat earther, we are not actually uh, engaging with his argument, but it's legitimate argument because uh, it casts doubt on everything he is saying uh, in this context if we have if we have a knowledge that it's more very likely that he is lying so he, in this context this kind of argumentation scene is totally fine if you for can somehow show that the other person would lie about the subject you are talking about, then it's fine to use that as part of your uh, argumentation against he, him and his argument, because it's relevant knowledge that he would be lying about this subject. Okay, okay and I'm, I'm going, going to stop here, here this week. And uh, it seems to, seems to me that I'm going to have to make a yet another video on the last fallacies on this video. This was a bit shorter video, but yeah. Next week I'm going to go over the rest of the fallacies. So if this was interesting to you, please come back in about a week. Bye.